it was my guys, they're gonna, are they gonna shoot my dad? I didn't know, I was only a youngster. But soon I was to be down into the coal mines and I went home and I asked my mother. And after a long while she told me, she says, Archie, she says, Daddy is on strike, the coal company won't give him any wages. It was 1909, and like Bill told you, and those company stores, the Raiden and so forth and so forth, and that was the UM, the PWA, and all those things. But what you're interested in now, how did it feel for a boy eight, nine, and ten years of age to go down into the coal mine, leaving school, nice warm school, and how did it feel to go down into a coal mine in the deepest, and still is, the most dangerous coal mine the world has ever known? I went down in that coal mine and I had a little glanny. Not the safety lamp, not the electric lamps, those clannies. That lamp was, uh, was made by a man by the name of Dr. Clanny, C-L-L-A-N-Y. Later on the safety lamp came in and that lamp was constructed and invented, if you may use the word, by a, name, by a man by the name of Sir Humphrey Davy. And he got that lamp yet as a safety lamp where you test for the gas. And of course, the ventilation in the coal mines, I'm not going to dwell too much on this because there's an investigation on it. But anyway, the, 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 the air is pumped into the coal. Some coal mines requires 200,000 cubic feet per minute in the coal mine. And those air goes all through the coal mine and it takes us with us this gas and then it comes up to the surface to an air shaft. It's called the intake and the other one is the outtake. And you mustn't have any more than 1% or a percent and a half of gas into the coal mine, but there's always gases in coal mines, but it must be kept under control. Now, the wages. <laughs> You'd never believe, now you talk about the galley slaves of old and everything, you'd never believe this, that a man would go down into a coal mine and work 12 hours for a, for a dollar five a day, and walk down and walk up. Then they had the peace can, then they had the bannock, you know, the Scotsman, the peace can, that was the reason it was called the peace can, the certain bread that our mothers used to make, and put it down and just cover the can, you see the, uh, the can, then the tea can, and all those things like that, you see, in the coal company houses. Now, let me say something about the coal company houses. The coal company houses were the best constructed houses that I've ever known of. But you see, where, where people are misled, you know, see, they say, oh, well, you people had a good time. You said the coal company houses. You said the company store. Look, the coal company houses, you're darn well paid for it. But you, one thing about the coal company houses, they were good, but you see, there was never any initiative for a man to build his own home. Do you know that we almost credit to believe this, that right in Glace Bay, that they never got the electrolytes in their houses till 1930? There was no water, there were open drains and so forth. But let us not stray away too far. Now I want you people, and so does Mr. Pittman, want you people to ask us questions about them. You can ask about ourselves, you can ask it about the officials, you can ask about carrying the bag, you can ask about how did this, who coined this expression and they can't stand the gaff. Who was it, where was it, when was it? Ask us those questions. Yeah. Interesting knowing, uh, your first day of work at Eddington Field, what, describe what it was like the first day. The first day in the mine? Well, uh, you were kind of happy because you had a job and you could chew tobacco when you became a man. <laughs> That's the most yeah. thing. You, you know what the man told me I was going to be promoted? Yeah. 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 You See, had uh, that, but later on, excuse me, but later on the feelings turned the other way. Yeah. The feeling turned the other way, mm -hmm. all right. You see, that was a channel, see, and that was a novelty. And all around the fireplaces and the coal company houses, just like we are here, see, they'd be talking. And you had, gosh, I'd like to be able to go in the coal mine. But your mother said no. And the only time you went into the coal mines was when there was really an accident happened. And the sad part of it was coal miners got killed in coal mines. Yeah. It's almost incredible to believe, my friends, and we don't want to bring it too much sorrow, that from 1893 up until 1971, 1,700 coal miners paid with their lives to be coal miners. I don't know the family. I don't know the family that all during my time, as a 50 years ago, I don't know of a one home that wasn't met with sorrow, 
and trials and tribulations of a coal miner and also to the strike, yeah. to the any, steel Any work. more questions? Now ask us the question before we go to Glace Bay. Uh, 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 Mr. McGibber wanted to ask, a few people to ask us questions. Go ahead. Yeah, good question. No, not all, not all. Some of those people that came in, they went and they took up Furman first, see? But they weren't even on it. My people came and I looked over and how never the name of God they existed, I don't know. They went to a place called French Road. Then some more went to a place called Grand Myra. But slowly then the coal mine stirred it. And all of a sudden there was such a demand for coal mines, they all came into the coal mine. I uh, see, and, uh, and, and the boom days, what they call the boom days was ni ni from 1902 to 1908. And there was all kinds of money made by the, see, the then, you see, the trouble was there was low wages. Yeah. That was a good question. Did they go? Ask the question. Mr. McIntyre, I'm wondering what would be the difference? You mentioned about the different size of, uh, of horses in the mines, but what about, what about the men working? A two-foot mine as opposed to working a seven-foot mine. Yeah. What would be the difference in work practices there? Was it that much more difficult? Yes, much more in the low mine. But I'll just go back a little bit. I missed this. See? Uh, the first of the coal mine was what was known as hand-picked coal miners. There was no machinery. And it was exceedingly dangerous. And you see, they had hand picks. Now, the low seams that Mr. McGill was talking about, that is where the coal is about that height, see? But they took so much stone, so much stone, and it made it extremely difficult for a tall man. But after a while, they got adapted to that, and the ponies came in, and the horse and the mules came in. You know about the mule. <laughs> Don't talk about the mule. Don't talk about the mule. I had one. The worst three weeks I ever had in my life. I'd have went to penitentiary any time at all for them three weeks to swap. You know, the mule that went in the coal mines, for three or four days, you couldn't get a better worker, boy, than any. He put all the rest to shame. But after a while, Mr. Mule decides that he's not going to work, and you try him to get him to work. And you know what brought him in? I often heard my mother and father saying, and not offending anyone in any way, they say, him or her, stubborn as a mule. I never realized that that big brown mule that said to me in his own actions, Archie, I'm not working today. <laughs> And he didn't work. And we used to steal oats, you know, from the stables and put it in our little coat pocket, you know. We didn't have the uh, you clothes, they had a, 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 an old lamp, and, and we'd get Mr. Mule, and you know what? Mr. Mule would start far enough till the box would tighten, and then he'd go. And this woman said to me, Archie, why didn't you hit him with your little whip? Oh, that'd be your Waterloo. He'd sit down, he'd lay down and break the shafts. <laughs> And then anyway, the mules were all sold. They said, get them out, get them out. This company man said, get them out. So this young fellow in Glace Bay seen a mule. I'm not going to tell the name because she's still living, but the man is dead. I was a young coal miner then. They didn't live, you know who it is. Yeah. You know who, she's still living. She's yeah. a wonderful old lady. And she, I'm not going to mention her name, but she offers it to me, Eric, you go ahead and mention it. No, I'm not going to mention it. But anyway, she had, he's, he, he's a grandson long ago, and he's a coal miner now. So he's seen this mule, and he come home, and he says, Mama, Mama, he says, I've seen a mule, a nice mule, I want to buy it, I want to buy it. Johnny, she says, her, her husband's name was Jim. Johnny, she says, you can't get that mule. They're father with that heart. Mules won't work. Mules won't work. They're stubborn. Ah, them cold, them Mama don't. So anyway, he came this after a while. The woman got talking to poor Jimmy, come home with his peace can and his lunch can, his knees knocking, staggering after coming home to the coal mines, and the first thing he met Mary tell him, Johnny wants to buy a mule. For the name of heavens, he says, woman, don't be so crazy. He says, what do you want? But anyway, like the women always so she won them. Won over and they bought the mule. <laughs> then they bought the wagon, the little fella bought harness and everything. And then after a while, they went and the little boy was ambitious and he started selling the apples and the things like that, and up in Glacemen, he went up in a second seat, and one day Mr. Mule, I says, he, he thought to himself, what am I doing? And my fellow are out in the pasture, so he stopped working. 
And so the young fellow said, I'll get him to go. So he took over the papers and the oil and everything. He put it under the mule. He set a fire underneath him. <laughs> and of course the mule, you know, was there. And he was sitting on the little stump. Not many houses around then. And after a while, Mr. Mule stirred and he said, oh, good. And the little fellow jumped in the wagon. And don't forget the mule was stubborn as a mule. He jumped in the little seat and how he went. And the mule went ahead and he looked around when the wagon was over the fire, he stopped again. <laughs> <laughs> then, there was another, then there was another story. We'll just go into a story and then you'll have to ask questions. Yeah. You know, there was some, like everything, there were some cranky women, you know. They gotta have the cranky women, you gotta have them. So anyway, this woman was a very, she was nagging her husband all the time. Nagging day and night, you know. We have some of them around yet, Bill. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and so anyway, he died. John died. And she was there for quite a while. She, so she met some of the prison. The woman said, Maggie, why don't you come down to my house and have a talk to John? How am I going to talk to John? John is dead. Oh, you can talk to John, sure. So they went, you come in the dark room and we'll all hold hand and we'll give you a signal. You'll say, hello, John. And John will answer you. So anyway, away they go. I don't know whether this in Glace Bear was up at number two where Billy was. And, it was so. <laughs> and anyway, so Maggie went and they all caught hands. Signal came. Hello, John. Hello, Maggie. How are you, John? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And, oh, that's good, she says. And, you know, she says, is it a lot better than earth yet? Another thing, she says, I'll be with you soon. He says, yes, I guess you will. And he says, my goodness, he says, heaven must be a wonderful place. He says, I'm not in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but then uh, now speaking ask the questions. We 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 cut them so we'll never get them to ask the questions. Who's building those company stores? Who's building? Yeah, who who built them? The company, the company, coal company. The coal, the companies. The company, but I mean, some of the local people were they hired? To oh them? yes, oh yes, oh yes, they were on there. Yeah. Uh, one the one of the men uh, was uh, became a film director years after was uh, William Curry, Tommy Curry's uh, grandfather. Uh, that's in here, funeral director in here. Well, his uh, grandfather, William Curry, was one of the contractors that built the coal company houses. And they but, hired local, yeah. local labor, you know. Yeah. Eh? One and of the things that we had that we were personally prejudiced or against the coal company was this. And uh, I'm going to be honest about it, we made mistakes. We made a lot of mistakes, such young coal miners were organizing, but there was one thing with it. And with the help of God and our people, we profited by our mistakes. As young as we were, we said, yes, we make a mistake. Mistakes will be made from the beginning of time, but we're going to profit by our mistakes. And how did we do that? When we're organized, we said to ourselves, how did we make that mistake? How did we give the advantage to the enemy that was going to keep our wages at a low ebb and not going to build the schools, not going to build the churches, not going to have a chance to raise up the little children, not going to have a chance to have sisters and teachers and professors and all are interested in money. We're not interested and in, in, in we're interested in how much money they make because we didn't want them to go to excess profit. What we were interested in now is to build the coming generation, my dear. Look, we're talking to you now because we were to be married if someone would have us, and they fortunately, unfortunately, probably some of them did. But we got along all right with them. We're, we're still with them, you know. Questions. So Questions. Questions. Question. Question about the, the checkoff that you were talking about yeah. before. Was, was say 1910. How much did they take off for rent? Uh, well, in uh, the That's double houses there, they're mostly, they went from 35 cents a week to a dollar forty-four, the rent. The old houses that they hauled from more in that old point and everything, the people were paying thirty-five cents a week from the old roost houses. That's right. And uh, the duplex houses they built, like you have on the Victoria Road there, they were a dollar forty-four uh, for one end, like. Yeah. Now, all right. Now, let us get. Let, let us just go back to to eighteen seventy-nine. Eh? Let's go back to eighteen seventy-nine, and. I'll tell you the story that this man's grandson told me he's dead and gone now, this young fellow from Spring Hill that they formed in 1879. And I says to him, how was it that your grandfather was so opposed 
to the PWA, the Provincial Workers Association. He says, Oh, Jesus, I'll tell you why my father was. Listen to this one. What a prophet he was. He says, My grandfather says, I'm not going to join that union. How? He says, I'll join that union when they'll allow me to pay my money out of, for rent out of my own pocket, when they'll allow me to pay my mo money for, the, uh, for my groceries in the company store across the counter so I can have my own money. You remember how to, Dr. Cody told us all about that? And so I can have my own money, so I can be able to live like a free man. And he says, and you know what all, he says, listen, he says, listen to this one. He says, the day will come he says, when the Dominion, with, with the company will use as an object, to, uh, uh, as a medium to gain their objective, they're going to use the coal company store and they're going to use the coal company houses. Ah, this fellow says, no, yes. He says, I can see it. He's dead and gone, that fellow. And you know what happened? What Bill told you about 1909? They said, if you don't come back and work in this, our, co our company union will cut your credit off of the company store and we'll throw you out of the coal company houses. The very thing that this man prophesied is so many years before. And of course, the coal company houses were good in one way, but don't forget this, that you paid for everything you got into it. The, we had the lamps, that's how we used to study in the years gone by with the lamps, and the lamps would get kind of shady kerosene oil. And how do the people live? You know, it would be surprising. Uh, the whole family be around the old Victoria stove in the morning That's right. trying to get warmed. Five o'clock in the morning in the coal mine. Yeah. You see, my friends, the reason we're doing this, see, we can't afford to tell you people lies because it'll react on us later on. It'd be foolish for me to come in here and tell you people lies. You'd say that Archie the Buck, he's a liar. He told us all the truth. He's romancing all the time. No, my friend, we romance two other ways too, you know. But, the, yes, yeah, sir. Go ahead. Uh, Archie. Were you obligated to buy at the company store? Once you got hired on by the yeah, coal, well, you can't buy from the company well, store. Once you go and buy from a private dealer. Now, that was the kind of question. Now, Billy, he asked me. Yes. Yeah. That, <laughs> now, yes. Are we, are we? In, the, in order for, uh, that was one of the obligations no, you had in the, in the early days, was to buy for the company store. But later on, in the years, you could go out and uh, buy from any merchant you wanted. And a lot of people, uh, I know that uh, years after my father went to the corporative, and he was with the corporative 53 years or something like that, 54 years, see. But it was years after, but first when the coal company stores were built and uh, people were hired on, that was one of the obligations. You paid the company doctor and you paid the hospitals and you paid everything through the checkoff. And the company store was one of them. And, they, and one of the obligations you had when uh, there was a fatal action, they weren't responsible for the action, they never claimed to be responsible for the action, uh, hire on the oldest son, and uh, he was obligated to deal in the company store. But years after, it was quite a few years after, they broke that down and you could go to any dealer at all. Or to, uh, yeah, the technique they had now for that, you weren't really obligated in one way, but indirectly or obligated in another. Yeah, Do you yeah. know why? We go and you get, a, when you get hired on. Eh? Your father's killed in the coal mines, or another, and then you got a mother and two little children, two little uh, brothers and sisters to look after. They'd ask you to join the coal company store. They even asked you to have their own doctors. They had their own doctors. And this Doctors Act didn't go uh, pass out of effect until 1919. And all right, no, I'm not going to join the company store. I'm going to go a little store my uncle got. So I'll tell you a joke about that one, too. And, and so they go, and they'll say, well, now, just a minute. And they go back, and they'll come back, and they'll say, Archie or Bill, I'm sorry now. We can't hire you on today, you know. He said, well, we're, we're pretty well crowded out. You go home and you tell Mama that, and Mama says, tell him we'll go on the company. Yeah. Ask yeah. the questions, yeah. ask the questions. You yes. You mentioned earlier there that uh, your, your wages were $1.05 a day. Yeah. What were the wages of the people that worked in these stores? <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing about it. Uh, as far as we know, they were getting about, they were getting anywhere around $6 a week or something like that, a clerk. And, uh, that is the reason why there was a lot of fellows uh, that got a little more education unless they might have went to grade five or grade six or something. They go clerking, clerking in the stores or 
clerk of the office like that. And uh, we never take one of them, what we call that time, paper jobs. We never take one of them paper jobs at all, you know, because you had to be dressed up every day and, and uh, we couldn't afford that. But these people, they work for very, very low wages, much lower than the minor people that were clerking and in the stores. Who were these people? Were these people uh, uh, daughters and sons of miners? Or? Yes, some of them were. Oh, yes, some of them were. But uh, the good jobs were mostly given to uh, uh, the doctor's sons and uh, uh, official sons and stuff like that. You know, Did it change much in some yeah. cases? There was, a kind of a, there was a class, to, there were a class to six in there. If, you were, if your father was a, a good union man or anything like that, and, and there was no chance of you getting into an office or getting into any of those jobs like that. You know, that, you, well, then, you might cause trouble. Yeah. <laughs> you said that you, um, before on your paycheck, that there was a, a deduction for the doctors. Now, yeah. is this a weekly? Oh, yes. Now, whether you've seen the doctor or not? Oh, yeah, whether you've seen the doctor or not, you... Uh, you oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You yeah, paid him every week. Oh, yes, you, that was the checkoff. Yeah. See, at that time, see, the doctor, you were paying the doctor 25 cents a week. Mm -hmm. And you were paying your church, and you were paying... All those things were automatically checked off you. Then when you dealt from the company store, and that store bill would come in, a store bill that time, you know, for a family would be around probably from nine to eleven dollars. Were the company store prices higher than other stores? No, the goods in the company store were the first class. They had uh, dry goods, groceries, hardware. They had everything in the company store that you could be on. Yeah, bought it. But uh, the prices, but what knocked down the prices when the Jewish merchants start coming in and they turn around and they go around cannabis and take customers. They take customers and then they stand a loss, a dollar a week. They give you so much on a dollar a week or 50 cents a week. A dollar when you catch me. Yeah. See, we had a, a, a merchant out there that used to go around.